morning. Oh, sorry, it's afternoon. Right. Yeah. Well, it's still morning elsewhere, right? But um, I don't know. Maybe where, where is it morning still? Hawaii or something? I don't know. Where is it morning? Or oh, which time zone? Sorry. Oh, you should have said. Say, well, it's uh, afternoon, Saka time. Zone. I was thinking of a different time zone myself, which is why I said morning. No, I'm just joking. I, I said morning because I thought it was still morning. Um, I don't lie, right? Well, I'm just joking. I try not to lie, but uh, I like some people I know, but <laughs> from this class, <coughs> cheaters and liars. Okay, um, so today, today, was, today is just going to be a simple walkthrough, and uh, I have to apologize up front. I will need to leave by 12.45 here, so and I came, or is it a minute or too late? Right, so a reminder, so we have, um, well, the only announcement that says that the quiz is due on Friday, right? So, I mean, I was looking up the mood and only six people had submitted by the time I was checking. So you, you want to make sure that you've, uh, you, you, you know, work towards that thing and then submit it before Friday. Once the thing closes, there's no extension, right? You have more than enough time to work through that example. I mean, through that, that um, quiz. Uh, also, I noticed someone uploaded something that has a very weird name, right? You will lose marks, you were taught, and you know who you are, right? Um, follow the rules. Okay, so now usually these, these, these things here are typically towards the end, right? Can you hear me at the back? Yes. You're, you're lying. Say no, but you can hear me. Can you hear me now? Okay, so typically this thing, this thing is usually towards the end. I thought I would, I would, um, I would, I would put it at the beginning, right? Please arrive early, right? There's always, there's always people that decide to come five, ten minutes late. And you're there, you know, where is Lighton? It turns out Lighton maybe is in the lab, which is here, right? Trying to uh, invigilate because we normally have two venues, right? So you want to come early. If I were you, I'd probably come 15 minutes early, right? It's not that hard. Um, so make sure you're here by 6.45 or something. At the very least, maybe 6.50. Also, come prepared, right? Even if you don't expect to use calculators, if I were you, I'd come with calculators, but of course I'm not you. Um, the usual stuff, right? Read the instructions. Always read the instructions and use the, the time that's given to the extra five minutes to thoroughly go through the questions so that you figure out which questions you must attempt first, right? Uh, test number three. There were still characters that were forgetting to include their, their details. Why? It's not that hard, right? You were taught how to write your names. I think it's kindergarten now. I remember I think we were taught how to do that grade one or two. But, but it was nursery school, kindergarten, right? Just write your name and your computer number, right? First thing you do is, once you're taught, you, you can start, write your name and your computer number. That's it. Right? It's not that hard. This will probably take you 10 seconds to write. You've been writing your name for years now, right? Please, um, let's follow the rules. For those that have been here, there'll be like a, a timer here, but I think the, the people that are in L-R-I-E, you're gonna have to depend on me writing the 20 minutes remaining on the board or something. I'm sorry, I apologize, but little I can do there. Okay, so again, I mean, time, we all know test is at seven, and then it's Friday. More importantly, the, the test is actually based on lecture series 19, 21, and 22. Right? You remember that 20 was just like an info session. Uh, it was like a class notes for the test. Not the questions I said, no. Right? Um, architecture, right? Although what we did in lecture series number, number 19, we just focused on um, the MIPS architecture itself as a whole, just a, a broad overview of what this MIPS architecture is all about. Um, so things risk-based, right, because um, instructions, right?
the value right in um, temporary agency. I also made mention of the fact that there's, it turns out the decision has to be made on whether uh, using little right? Specifically, we avoided our, we our discussion with regards to numbers anyway, our discussion to integer numbers. We send with four that require double precision. Um, yeah. Um, the uh, if I were you, I'll, I'll advantages of one over the other. Instances when one is used over the other. Right? If you ask architecture, you should be able to tell us and be able to say that is the case. Right? Advantages of all of these things. I mean this this is all out there. Right? Um, to registers, the 32 registers, and some registers, right? Uh, so far as in 32 of them that we work with, right? So register zero all the way up to register number three, right? But, but, but in a we have special purpose registers, things like PC, high, low, right? Special register. Uh, you should be able to, to give examples and, and tell us scenarios where one is used or the other. Is V not a special purpose register? It is. Really? Okay. It is apparently. I'm not checking whether it's a special purpose to be a but I don't know. Is it? What does it do? How many say it is? How many say it doesn't? Oh, okay. What's the definition of what, what do we mean by saying it's a special purpose register? What do we mean by that? Function, not operation. Like it's it's not a yeah, but function operation. Special purpose, right? So V0 is we know what it does, right? Um, okay, and specifically we typically make use of this when we're working with system calls, certain system calls, right? That's what makes it special, I guess. It's like uh, A node. And really, we realize that uh, um, uh, most of these registers can be represented by mnemonics, right? So uh, a register like uh, uh, P naught is, in fact, register number eight, right? You know, go figure. Um, and then in terms of endianness here, uh, we, we said that uh, what we mean by, by endianness is essentially the way in which the bytes are ordered in memory, right? Uh, so it's either you could decide to say you're gonna order the, the data from, um, the, well, from the least significant bit to the uh, most significant bit or the most significant <coughs> bit to the least significant bit relative to the lowest memory address, right? Um, so in terms of uh, little endian here, uh, what we discovered was that in fact the um, the least significant byte is stored in the lowest memory location. But for big endian, it's the opposite, right? The most significant byte is stored um, in the lowest memory location. Um, something else we, I don't know if we, may, we probably did mention this, we mentioned that uh, when you're playing around with SPIM, it, depending on what sort of, I guess, computer you're working with, it might just turn out that uh, the endianness that you observe might be different from a, a person who's using a completely different machine. I can't quite give an example right now, but it turns out that the way these SPIM simulators like QT SPIM work is they present to you information based on the endianness used on the host machine. So like in my case, um, 
in my case, in my case, my machine uses my machine uses a little engine. So what I see in in SPIM, when I when I'm viewing data in memory in SPIM, I will view that data like from perspective of little engine. Um, I, I do know that uh, certain, I guess certain, is it Mac based machines or something? I don't know if that's what they're called. At some point used a big engine, but I, I can't quite give an example of something else that uses big engine, right? Um, so, but anyway. it's, it's essentially just the way in which memory is organized. Like, so this particular example is showcasing little engine. Why? Uh, because we are, well, incidentally, we are, we are storing ICT 11.10, right? Well, it's in base 10, but we know that we can, we can actually view this data. It's in binary in memory, but then we can also view it in hexadecimal, right? So now this is ICT 11.10, and what we're doing is we are ordering the least significant bit first, and then we have the most significant <coughs> byte here, right? ICT, I mean, so not ICT 11.10. 11.10 base 10 converted to hexadecimal is 4.5.6. So in fact, what this, this stream of data would be organized as, would be organized in QT stream, like on my machine, is it would be like so. Um, 0, 0, 0, 4, 5, 6. Right? Uh, because this is the most, uh, this is the, the, the most significant byte. Yeah? But if we flip things around, if we're using big endian, it's the opposite. See, the memory address is still the same, but then the, the, the most significant byte is going to occupy the smallest memory location. Right. Anyway, and then we, we had a discussion of uh, so-called MIPS data types, I mean, so things like, uh, you know, characters, um, we, we know the number of bytes that are used to represent a character. Um, and this is easy to remember, right? Think of ASCII, for instance, right? Oh, there's no space in here. There are people saying, I don't know. I apologize on behalf of uh, the department and the University of Zambia. Sorry for the terrible experience, but uh, hopefully we can fix this at some stage, I don't know. All right, so we, we actually worked, predominantly, predominantly worked with integers and characters. Characters because we were interested in, uh, in working with textual content, right? So a, a phrase like ICT uh, is composed of three characters, I, C, and T. Right, and then we, we also did, uh, work, worked a lot with integers specifically because we were, we were playing around with uh, arithmetic operations at some stage when we started looking at MIPS assembly language program, right? But, but take our point here is you should know the different types of data types that are represented in MIPS um, and, and, and really the, um, the, the number of bits that are used to represent those particular data types, right? So how many bits uh, does a byte, com is a byte composed of? How many bits is a double, is a float? composed of. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, and then we, we, we did something highly unusual. Before we started our discussion of uh, those different instruction formats, what we thought would be wise was for us to look at the, the core elements that make up an assembly language program, right? So still a part of lecture series number 19 here. And, and so we, we looked at, uh, if you remember, really, we looked at this core components here, aside from the actual instructions. So comments, directives, blank lines, um, labels, and specifically we actually focus more on the main label because it says a certain purpose. Um, and that is to act as an entry point once you execute the program. That's where execution initially starts from. Right? Um, so given, uh, I guess, an assembly language program, we should be able to identify the different elements and what um, what they're used for. So we know that the comments is always prefixed by uh, a pound sign or a hash, right? Um, we, we, we have inline comments and, um, inline comments and these are, is it line comments or something, right? It serve a different purpose. Um, key thing though when it comes to comments is that everything after the pound sign is not gonna be uh, interpreted by by the assembler, right? It'd be ignored by the assembler. It doesn't serve any purpose. Um, we did learn though that comments are important because they help uh, provide additional details as to what the program <coughs> is all about. In the event that you want to share it with somebody else, or if you want to refer to the program at a later stage, right, at a later point in time. Like, imagine you want to, um, 
to look at, uh, to maybe refer to the quiz number 18 solution next year. Right? For you to remind yourself of what you did, if you, you are as slow as I am, then you'd have to put comments there to remind yourself of why you're making certain decisions. What are you, why, are you, why are you doing this here? What, what, what's the purpose of doing this, right? Um, um, and then we also, we thought it was important to discuss this whole notion of blanks, and specifically that just like comments they ignored by the assembler, doesn't serve any purpose, but the reason we have them is they, they make our instructions or source code more readable, right? Um, and in fact, we, 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 we can get a sense of what is ignored by the assembler and what is not by simply um, loading this particular source program into Qt Spim, for instance, <clears throat> or Mars, or whatever uh, simulator I might be working with. And then you look at the, the column that shows you what's going to be executed. Right? Typically, uh, things like line number four, line number nine will be ignored. Line number five as well will be ignored. Right? So you only have like a representation in memory. Um, and then we also discussed some directives and we're most interested in the text directive and the global directive because it turns out that most, most of the programs that we were writing were actually making use of these two things, right? So text simply signals to the assembler to say what follows is going to be the source code that you want to be executed, right? And the global just um, points to the label that's going to act as the main label. It turns out that you can, you can name the main label using a different name, not main. Ma main is used by convention. If you want, you can, you can name it global entry, for instance, right? which is why you need to explicitly state um, that this is actually the, the main label. Right? And this becomes very useful in instances where you have more than one label. Right? As we noticed when we were working with, um, with uh, branch instructions, for instance and procedures, because it turns out that all those contiguous instructions that are associated to each other <clears throat> are represented using labels, right? So if you have a branch condition, you know, you're going to branch to a label, right? And so if, if you have multiple labels, you need to explicitly state which, which of the labels is going to be the main label, right? Where execution is going to start from, right? Okay, and then after this, right, this is pretty, I guess is probably going to be the easiest topic in the, in the test, right, out of what, what's coming in the test, I guess, in my opinion, I don't know. Actually, everything, actually, because we're only basing everything on just one theme here, MIPS instruction set, right. But then we, we, we started a discussion of um, these different instruction formats insofar as MIPS is concerned. Again, I just wanted to emphasize or underscore the fact that Depending on which instruction set architecture might be using, you'd be working with different sort of instruction formats. But as far as, as, far as MIPS is concerned, there are just three different types of instruction formats. Right? We had a, a very lengthy discussion about these things. Um, some interesting things associated with the so-called MIPS instruction formats here is the fact that the first six bits are reserved for the opcode for all the different instruction formats. Right, so remember, MIPS instructions are one word long. We allow 32 bits in size, right, or, five, or four bytes in size. And so what we're saying is that out of the 32 bits, the first or the six, six bits are reserved for the opcode, right, depending, uh, irrespective of whether you're working with R, I, or J format instructions. Um, but then as you, as you start you know, looking at the individual instructions, you notice that after the six bits here, um, things change slightly here. I mean, there are, com there, there are similarities between the R, R, R format and I format, like things like a source register number one is the same, right? As in it's presented by the same um, bit segment, right? Also, uh, source register number two, same bit segment with one difference, the fact that for an I format instruction, RT acts as a destination, right? Um, yeah. So we, we actually went through the trouble of trying to, to really understand how we go about decoding an instruction to, to, to derive the machine representation or the machine represent, the representation of that same instruction um, as executed or seen by the machine. Right? We know that uh, a machine executes or works with ones and zeros, but when we're dealing with um, 
assembly language, when we were studying these things, we had to abstract the ones and zeros by looking at assembly language programs, and we realized that we can actually derive what the machine sees, right? The ones and zeros, the streams of ones and zeros. Specifically, the th two streams of ones and zeros, right? So, and it's quite easy, really, if you know the, excuse me, if you know the type of instruction that you're working with, it's very easy for you to derive the machine representation. Everybody in here is, is now able to derive the machine representation of whatever instruction you're given, provided you are given the lookup table that tells you um, um, the mapping of this particular instruction to, let's say, hexadecimal binary. Yes, it's a phrase. Is it wrong that? Yes, it will, it will result in the wrong thing. This is why the order is important. But you know that the... Sorry? But when you already have the... Uh-huh. I don't get the question. I mean, um, yes, maybe tell us if that's what... I'm guessing he's trying to help you. Tell us if that's what you mean. Yes. I don't think it's clear. I thought when you were trying to take the oh. two binary, they're supposed to put the definition of the unit class of the No. What? Who said that? What do you mean this is what that's what has happened? Look at from a sense to machine, we were told there is something that's what is the fact that the source range is that. I'm, I'm confused. What are you talking about? T2 is 10. T2 is 10. What are you talking about? Listen, this, this stream of bits, the first, the first six bits are there. Op code. This is an R formatted instruction. Op code. Why is op code 0, 0? Because all R format instructions have an op code of 0. The second is what? Source. The third stream of five, the, the next five is target, or source number two. And then followed by destination. And then followed by the shift amount. In this case, shift amount is zero because we're not shifting anything. And then finally, six. Yes, but after that, that you write the way you do it, um, you start with the destination when you start, then you go to the destination. Well, if they do, I don't know who told you that, but I mean, sorry? Listen, excuse me. Doesn't matter who told you what. Lighton could have told you that, but Lighton would have been wrong at that point in time. Keep telling you, don't don't use that as an excuse. Oh, he said, she said, no. What does literature say? You have reference documentation. What does it say? We we've been discussing the order of these things here for what for weeks now, right? What are you talking about? I think the confusion is yeah. The way the the way the system looks at the instruction is different from the way we look at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember there's always said that so it's after the whole <coughs> code, instead of the source register, it's the target register. <coughs> then the source register, then the destination register. In binary. Yes. When you're converting in binary. Sorry, you said what? For example, if I try to convert that instruction to binary. The, wait a minute, I, I might have a, a, a crap. The only things that are probably swapped here is T0 and T1. Yes, which is the... Because T, T0, yeah, this is just a mistake here. The target is T2. Yes, t, the target is T2. The destination is still going to be T2. It doesn't change, yes. but, but these things are swapped. And there's one way of finding out if what you're doing is the right thing. All you have to do is you come to QD spin, and am I, are we going to do this, by the way? Who changes, right? Who changes?
He said, she said. I, I was I was almost thinking that uh, excuse me, I was almost thinking that there was there's going to be a, a, a nice way of looking at the user text. Um, binary, but he said she said. There's, there's bound to be an online. Uh, has anybody come through, come across an online calculator that that does a conversion for you? You have, right? Who's that? Who said yes? Yeah, yeah you did, right? <laughs> I don't want to waste time uh, doing things. So here's the thing, right? If I one way of trying to find out if what Nonde said or what Lighton said is wrong is you can use something like this, right? It allows you to punch in, um, it's allowing this particular nice, nothing fancy here, it's allowing you to, um, to get the, the binary representation what the machine sees, right? So in this case, hopefully this piece of text here that you see here should be the same as what we are seeing um, in here. I did mention that I swapped, I think I swapped T0 and T1 here, so Hopefully I've fixed it now. If I copy this across, um, it should be the same, hopefully. And one way of finding out if it's the same is segment them like so. Right. So don't listen to light on or nonde. Read, right? This is this is what this is what we are here to do, to to do research and try and find out what we're doing is the truth. So hopefully this makes sense, right? Decoding of an instruction, very important. If I were you, I would understand this. But hey, again, I am not you. Yes? Yes? Mm -hmm. No, oh, because this is with the people that invented this. This is how it works. No, no, no. So it turns out if if so, what she's asking, in case people are wondering, I'd say what 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 is she ranting about? She's 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 saying, you see, under normal circumstances, we say the instruction is represented like so: destination, input one, input two. But but what the machine does is it does this. And then input, right? Input, input one, and then uh, destination somewhere, right? Yeah. Right. So in this case, T two. The reason is, if you think about it, the first thing here, the, the line number one is almost exactly the same as the mathematical representations that you you are used to. A is equal to B plus C or A is equal to one plus two. It's a lot easier for you to understand what's happening when you represent an instruction like this, rather than if you say this, it's confusing, it's even much more confusing, right, so. But it turns out that the mapping is, is the way it is because the, the, the different segments, the different bit segments serve different purposes for the different instruction formats. So it has to be a way of optimizing, optimizing things and making sure that you can reuse them when you're working with an R formatted instruction. Okay. Hope that makes sense. He said the destination first. Zzz, wrong. Um, sorry. Yeah. Then they, they said, well, she was wrong. Then when I was saying he, she, no, they said you were wrong. But I'll tell him to listen to the recording. Okay. So for <laughs> doesn't matter. Bottom line is 
we know that the format we follow is this. And this is predefined, -de predetermined, right? When it comes to an R format instruction, you know the bit segments and what they represent. When it comes to an I format instruction, you know the bit segments and what they represent. When it comes to J, J format instruction, you know what it represents. Okay. Uh -huh. The result of yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's why you mentioned they you won't have to literally transmit like that to the two is going to be at the far end after the no, it has to be followed. What I'm saying is, this particular example, like the representation here, is supposed to be swapped. And I think I mentioned this when I was walking you through this example, but I just never corrected. It turns out I copied the error here, which is why you should comment on the slides, but you don't, right? So, it's, it's not, you must follow this. You, you must follow this, because this will tell you what mapping you should use for the instruction itself. So if you have uh, T2, T0, T1, this will always be RD. This, whether you like it or not, will always be RS. This will always be RT. Yes, when I'm writing in assembly language, or in machine language, I need to do, to do this, because there it's saying the destination comes after the source. So I need to, to make sure my destination is at the destination. Well, if you want to, if you, if that's, if you understand life better, if you understand these things better that way, that's fine. But a nice way of understanding this is, and I'm telling you, we, when we were discussing, when we were discussing these different instruction formats, this had a representation that said this is opcode, this is RD, this is RS, this is RT. So if you know that this is opcode, this is RD, this is RS, this is RT, all you have to do is get these things and replace them here. Where is RD? It's here. You move T2 here. Where is RS? It's here. You move it here. Where is RT? It's here. You move it here. That's all you have to do. Okay. Yeah. Then that's fine. Then okay. Fine. Fine. <laughs> that's what you meant. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then the. R format instruction, right? Probably the easiest. You're only working with four segments. Um, the opcode first six bits is the opcode, and then uh, R R S, and then R T, and then the immediate value, right? Um, and then again, just like an R format instruction, you can actually decode this. The difference here is that the the destination register which is, uh, and I, I see here I was uh, swapping a, a lot of things. This is RT and whatnot. The destination register is the first, is the first register after the opcode. So this is supposed to be RT. Anyway, you can fix this. Just use the calculator and fix this. What I'm saying is if we had a add, uh, let's try and use our calculator here and see if we we'll get the same representation. It's a good thing we found the calculator, right? Add I, T naught, uh, zero, and negative 2019. Hopefully this will be able to work. Uh, let's see. I don't know why this is, uh, maybe it doesn't recognize the zero, I guess. Um, Okay, this is not working. Um, okay, let's let's just assume register zero is substituted by RT. Why is this thing not working still? Oh my goodness, I don't know what's happening here, right? Yeah, which is weird. Okay. 
I see. So it wants um, it wants us to represent the the number in hexadecimal, not um, not uh, in decimal. So let's let's just assume this is not 2019, but it's uh, the one we had, 456, right? Is that fine? 456 is ICT 11. I mean 1110. Uh, so if this is zero and then this is also register zero, hopefully this works. Um, if we copy this bit representation, what I'm trying to say is that, uh, boom, I'll replace, in case this is confusing, I'll replace this with 1110. Um, <clears throat> Are people following through with what I was saying? Yes. What I was saying was that um, when it comes to an I format instruction, the, the first component, the first register is always RT, not RS. It should be RT. And so I was just showing you that it's RT because we just converted this. The correct representation of this is T0, right? Uh, T, T0 was, oh, it's this one. This is the correct one, right? Yes. yes. Zero one. This is what we copied. For, oh, so this is the correct one. Okay, so it's it's fine. I think it's fine. <laughs> it's fine because uh, so <laughs> it's it's fine. It's fine because it's. What, what am I saying? Sorry. It's fine. So it's still supposed to be RS. My bad. Because we can't we can't swap this thing. It's still supposed to be RS. But uh, the order is the same here for the segmentation. But this entry here is what's going to be RT. The result that you get once you compute this has to be put in the target register, RT. Source register RS is used with immediate value to perform the computation. So if it's add R, you are adding what is in source register and what is in the immediate value, and then you put them in the target register. Right? So, and then what's in the target register? So this 8 here would have to be here, not the 0. Swap this. Okay, um, and then finally, oh, sorry. <laughs> finally, it's a J format instruction. That's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Is this fun? I don't know. Um, is it much more fun than the, the integration in maths, right? Um, the, co the correct representation we're working with is is this, right? So what, what I was saying is that What I was saying is that when you look at the machine representation of add i dollar sign t naught, this is add i dollar sign t naught dollar sign zero, 1110. Imagine this was add i dollar sign t naught dollar sign zero, 1110. What we're supposed to get, because the only thing we have to re replace here, if this is correct, the only thing we have to replace in these two segments is this immediate value because we're saying this is 1110, right? But if you notice the representation here, there's a misnomer here. This number is not the same as this. Because when decoding, I or we swapped what was meant to be RS, this zero was supposed to be the source. The eight register, the T naught was supposed to be the target because this is where you're putting the result, which is why the the zero zero is swapped with the zero one uh, zero zero zero. Do you understand now? Yeah, yeah well, I mean, com comment on the slides, you, you just go home and you go and play, continue playing, right? Um, and then, 
Oh, I, I, I didn't include the example of the J format here, but essentially when it comes to the J format instruction, um, all you are doing here is, uh, the difference is that the opcode, which is the six bits, represent the, the actual instructions. It could be something like J or jump and link, JAL, for instance. And then the remaining 26 bits uh, represent the target uh, address, so where you're going to jump to in memory, right? Uh, so this is probably the easiest to decode because the only thing you need to do is, uh, is uh, uh, come up with a binary representation of the operation you might be working with. So if it's J, you just use a lookup table to figure out what the machine representation of J is. Sometimes the lookup table might be in hexadecimal, so all you have to do is convert the hexadecimal to binary, right? Using six bit representation, and then you convert the, yeah, yeah, for J. For you to convert an instruction, the opcode, you got your lookup table if it's in hex, and then you convert from hexadecimal to binary using six bit representation. Okay, this is easy, right? I don't know where the mm was coming from here. And then finally, we, we looked at uh, actual MIPS assembly language, right? Hopefully by the time we are working through this next year, once we are working with high-level programming languages, you'll be able to put two and two together. So when you're using a for loop or a while loop, it actually maps onto this particular construct on a very low level, right? But, but we focus really our attention on arithmetic operations, system calls, branching loops and procedures. Not so much, right? Specifically when it comes to mathematical operations, we just looked at uh, uh, common math operations that we're used to. So how do we add numbers? How do we subtract numbers? How do we multiply and divide? And it turns out that the behavior is different depending on which operation you're working with, right? So there's one overloaded version of DIV, for instance, and, and not the pseudo instruction, but the actual bare instruction. That puts the result, the quotient, into the low register and the remainder into the high register. But if you use the version of DIV that allows you to use three uh, op operands, you put the result of, or you put the quotient into the destination register. But that's a pseudo instruction, you know this. And then we, uh, so this is an example of a math operator really because MIPS is register based, you have to load the values that you're gonna be uh, performing the math operations on into registers and then compute your result, which is also going to be um, slotted or put into a register, right? And then so for system calls, we said that these are nothing more than services that we request from the operating system. Right. Um, there might be things that we might want to do with a computer system that we don't have direct access to for security reasons, obviously. And so we, we go through the kernel of the operating system, we request from the operating system that particular service. And it turns out that there's an order that we have to follow. For certain system calls a la exit, system call code number 10, all you have to do is specify the system call code 10 and then you use the syscall. But the way that you specify it is you need to put the value 10 into that special register that someone mentioned. V, V0 or V0, right? Um, turns out when you're printing an integer, slightly different scenario here. Of course, the table we provided for you, you look at this and you know that for you to print an integer, you first of all need to specify system call code one, and then you put the value you wish to print into special uh, purpose register A0, and then you use the syscall, three-step process, right? When you're printing a, a string, three-step process where you specify um, the system call code that you want to use, which is four, and then you load the address of the string that you wish to print, because the string is sitting in memory, right? You typically define it in the data directive, the data section of your program. And then you use this call, and then that string will be printed out, right? So the, the key thing here is uh, that there are different processes that you follow for you to request specific services from the kernel, right? Um, and then we looked at branching, probably one of the uh, simplest uh, uh, constructs that we looked at, right? When you're branching, all you have to do is specify the instruction that you want to work with. Uh, are you branching if two values are equal? Are you branching if uh, one is greater than the other, pseudo instruction? Are you branching if they're not equal? But once you compare the values in two registers, you will branch the specified uh, label. <coughs> that label must be defined in your source code. So once that condition is satisfied, you branch, or you direct program flow to, to the branch label, right? All you're doing really when you're working with branch instructions is you're, you're altering the, the flow of the program because the default behavior is such that execution is top to bottom. 
but you can alter the behavior or the flow of the program by using this contract, like branch or loops, for instance. Right, so this is the syntax. Very easy because all you need is these two things here, the label and the actual instruction. And lo and behold, this is an I format instruction. And then we looked at loops, pretty basic stuff here. It's all centered around repetition. We're saying for us to be able to repeat um, a particular execution of an instruction or a group of instructions, uh, we advise that we go through a four-step process where we first of all initialize values that we're going to be working with, and then we figure out the condition that is going to allow us to get out of the loop because the goal is once you're done repeating the instructions, you must get out of the loop. You don't want to continue doing that, right? Because you end up choking your machine. So the condition that will enable you to branch out of the loop and then the loop body will comprise of the instructions that you're going to be repeating, including the instructions that are going to modify the initial values. Because for you to, to, um, to get to a stage where you branch out of this loop body, you continuously modify the initial values up to such a point in time when the initial value satisfies, one of the initial values satisfies the condition. Again, what is part of the loop body is actual processing. So are you, are you repeatedly printing certain numbers, for instance? Right? So as you are printing those numbers, you modify the initial values. And then you get out of the loop. For you to repeat the loop, it's easy. Unconditional branch, unconditional branching, B, followed by the label, or jump, as someone told us. Sir. Yes, sir. Oh. No, it doesn't matter. I mean, so it, what, what, sometimes if you, if you swap these things, the behavior will be slightly different. So if you check the condition after processing, you might end up with a situation where you print something that you are not meant to print. So you print an extra value, for instance. So it depends on what sort of, uh, if you want to put the condition towards the end, then you'll have to change the processing in a way. If it works for you. Yeah, it, it does work, depending on how you, you, you write the problem, it does work. There are instances where you check, you, check the, you check the condition first and then you process, or you process and then check the condition. It does work. These are just guidelines. It's not set in stone. It's not like this is what you're supposed to do. Guys, I need to rush somewhere. And then we, we looked at uh, procedures. Um, ah, this was probably the, the easiest thing. We said the goal here is to try and deduplicate code, right? So we identify segments of code that are used um, often in your source program, and then you just come up with... Uh, a group of instructions that are just going to represent what is repeated. Right? So if you have portions of uh, instructions that essentially just uh, allow you to exit, the argument is that why not just create an uh, a procedure that you refer to in line number 15 here. Instead of uh, repeating the same code segments here, 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 and perhaps even you know, uh, other portions of your source code. And the process is pretty um, simple here. You define the procedure first. It's a label, uh, and, and so once you, 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 you specify the instructions associated with that procedure, as a last step, you just have the instruction RA. No, no. What do you have? I don't know. What do you have? JR space RA must always be the last step in your procedure. Instructions that are going to, to, so if you are exiting, the same instructions that you use to exit code, followed by JR space RA. And what you're doing essentially is once the jump and link, followed by the name of the procedure is executed, uh, once the, the instructions are executed in the procedure, program flow will be directed to the next instruction after JAL, right, which is why you have JR dollar sign RA. Right, and the way that, that you refer to, or that you evoke the procedure, essentially just jump and link followed by the name of the procedure. So jump and link space, the name of the procedure. Uh, I'll see you when you see me, which is Friday, bright and early. Uh, I'll be here quite early. I need to rush for, yeah. Sorry? Well, it's the same, here and there. Those that will be from here. Yes. Where? 
I don't know, it's a test, it's an exam, right? I don't know. Ten years from now, what are you going to be doing in life? Ah, but you are preparing for that time, right? Uh, well. I don't know, I honestly don't know how many programs, but enough to, enough to, to sort out the issue of, uh, uh, you know, enough to be done in those, in that time frame. Right? Uh, 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 good people, I'll see you when you see me Friday.